Todd Richards here, Roots Hearts. And Soul. Stefan and I are launching this podcast based off cookbook Roots Heart and Soul by myself, Todd Richards, with a great help from Chef Stefan, the man, the myth, the legend himself. Oh, you stop, you. We have such a beautiful history together. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Really, what people are going to get from this podcast is telling the story of of Afro people, Afro cuisine. We're going to be telling the story of the Pan-African diaspora. Roots, heart, soul of the of the world, as we say. We are we launching in a couple of weeks here. Some terrific guests. Stay tuned. Follow us on all our social media at Chef Todd Richards in all formats. Chef Stefan, what's yours? Chef Stefan dot i t a y i t i. This is the correct way to say Haiti. Well, we're getting education already. So if you want to find out more, if you want to listen to great stories being told by amazing, amazing culinary talents, we're going to be hearing stories from Africa all the way to the Caribbean, all the way to the Americas. It's going to be it's going to be something special. Giving everyone a good rhythm, the good vibes. Yeah, baby. We look forward to seeing everyone. Talk soon. Bank. And I'm Greg Benson. And this is an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup, the critically acclaimed award-winning syrup that helps gringo bartenders better make margaritas, wait, wait, Negronis, Lou, hold and up, hold up, wait. Old Are you just fashions? This is how you start your podcast. What? It's not an ad for Ancestral Agave Syrup. Well, of course it is. I'm just cutting costs by not paying writers to make something new. I'm just using an old script. You pay writers? That's some kind of jab. No, I'm just saying what, that. What What are you saying? Well, look, we've got this amazing syrup that's made in an ancestral manner, cooked down from the sap of the agave, harvested the way these families would to make polke. It's a quality product. It deserves yeah, a yeah. quality presentation. Yeah, okay, okay, hang on. <clears throat> ancestral agave syrup is made by real families following traditional methods, unlike the industrial Blue Weber syrup you get everywhere else. Ancestral is cooked down from aguamiel, harvested from Salmiana in Hidalgo, Mexico. It is the grade A Vermont maple to the sticky diner syrup you've been using for your cocktails. Ingredients matter both in how your cocktail tastes and how you treat the earth. Ancestral is better for both. Is that good? Uh, sure, or maybe confusing instead of cheesy. Uh, look, just visit ancestralagave.com to learn more and to order your world-class agave syrup today. And we'll call that a wrap. Catch you next ad, Greg. Uh, hasta pronto? Ancestral Agave Syrup. Available online at ancestralagave.org and wherever Greg and Lou are able to coerce store owners into carrying it. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. So you don't shun the devil with your rock and roll load. Knows that country music's gonna save your soul. The devil runs his groove. Welcome back to the Speakeasy. I'm Souther Teague. And I'm Greg Benson. Greg, I hear you're not hanging out in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, but you're still in Williamsburg. Please explain. That is correct. I am in Williamsburg, Virginia, a.k.a. Colonial Williamsburg, where you can buy hand-churned butter for 10 bucks, as opposed to a Williamsburg, Virginia, where you can buy hand-churned butter for 30 uh, I was down here over the weekend doing the Wine and Whiskey Festival, the first annual hopefully, Wine and Whiskey Festival in Williamsburg, Virginia. And honestly, uh, it was a ton of fun. Um, this is a town that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I went to college here, and as a native Virginian, I took many a field trip here. So I've been coming to Williamsburg for probably over 30 years at this point. And that's a lot of years for, for how, how few years more than that you have. Exactly. <laughs> and for the first, I'd say, 25 to 28 of those uh, – Nothing ever changed. <laughs> that was kind of the, the the town was very content, still pretending that it was 1776 indefinitely. Uh, nothing was ever different, and in that way, it was kind of comforting. It's this fun little time capsule, but also, uh, you know, 
resting on your laurels like that does lead to things becoming a little stagnant. And it's actually been really cool to watch um, the Chamber of Commerce down here and also some friends of mine who have gotten involved in this um, actually really work to bring some really cool new businesses to the area. So I was doing some whiskey classes at this really amazing uh, farm to table restaurant uh, where the bartender after my last class was done uh, was like, I've been waiting all weekend for you to finish up these classes because he's like, you seem like the sort of person who enjoys a hurricane. And I say, that's right, I do. I'm glad that I'm glad that the internalness of my love of hurricanes is reflected in my outward vibe. And I actually got perhaps the best hurricane I've ever had made for me at, at a bar. Um, miles away from the hand grenades on Bourbon Street, I can tell you that. But it's also just really cool to see how the city is attracting people who are wanting to do you know, newer, cooler, sort of more experimental stuff and still sort of pay homage to what the town has been for the last uh, couple centuries or yeah, so. Yeah, for as long as it's existed. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, that's cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in one little random piece of information here. I don't know if you saw, but we had our first Cat 4, uh, Category 4 Hurricane of the Year already, earliest one ever in recorded history. Wow, um, so, it's like uh, the climate's changing or something. So, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like we may have interfered with weather patterns in some way weird um further study is needed that's just my <laughs> we need more people to agree um that's just my two cents on the hurricane um but uh um sounds like you're having a great time down there and w uh, l help me and the listener understand you were taking classes or you were teaching classes i was teaching the class look at I you was teaching the the one teaching is learning classes. greg way to go i know no i mean I, it's what they say about uh you know you teach the best way to learn something is to teach it uh i could never remember the names of the two men who started the japanese whiskey industry and after having to talk about them for an hour and a half i don't think i'm ever going to forget the names of uh, Masahiro Takatsuru and Sinjiro Torii. Uh, they're up here forever. I also uh, led a walking tour through Colonial Williamsburg. And if anyone, if you've ever, if you've never been to Colonial Williamsburg in the summertime, let me illustrate for you what it's like thusly. Um, when I was a teenager, I was down there and I was uh, having a discussion with someone about the weather in this part of the world at this time of year. And I mentioned that I'd heard it compared to the surface of the sun and the person that I was talking to who lived there at the time thinks about this for a second and goes, I don't know if I'd say that's accurate because I always pictured the surface of the sun being more of a dry heat. So it is <laughs> swampy. Yeah. And having to walk around for an hour and talk about whiskey, uh, even at 10 a.m. was um, I didn't I didn't let get people get too close towards the end of that. Copy that, that. chat. Let me just say that. But it's a. Uh, Lovely, lovely town, lovely people, uh, real salt of the earth, and uh, I'm excited to do it again next year. Hopefully, that's the thing about these first annual things is that they uh, they're they're very they become recurrent. Yes, exactly. Well, I'm glad to hear you're down there teaching and learning. Uh, but you got someone uh, in the studio for us today that's going to teach us some stuff for sure, and I need to learn about it. So let's get to the show. Yes, absolutely. I'm excited to learn about this too because we're going to be uh, I'm at least going to be completely switching gears from whiskey to tequila. Not only any type of tequila, but Cristalino tequila. I'm very excited to learn about it. We have with us Me in too. the studio Jaime Salas, the uh, brand advocate for Cristalino, uh, here to advocate for Proximo, or excuse me, the brand advocate for Proximo Spirits. So I'm excited to hear you advocate for it, Jaime. Thank you so much for, for joining us in the studio today. We're happy to have you. Greg, thank you for having me. It's uh, good to know I'm in good company with other fellow, you know, spirits educators. I mean, that's the, that's the, I, I always say this at the end of every uh, class I get to teach or talk I get to give, where I always say, I'm like, I'm only going to be completely serious one or two times during this talk. But like, this is the one time where I say, that this is my favorite part of my job. And I want everyone to know that like, I truly genuinely mean that like, there's something so great about being able to like share these stories and these anecdotes and all of the fun coincidences that led to these amazing spirits that we have. And I'm really, really excited to talk to you about uh, a style of spirits that I think would, would it be fair to say it's been maligned over the last yeah. few years? Would that be a good verb? Yeah, it's something that's burgundy. It's something that's really developing, and people are are taking taking notice. And you're you're spot on that it's all about stories, right? And at the end of the day, I think this one has a great one. This is this is one of those things where I think you're living it in real time, 
and you know generations after us will appreciate you know when we go back and tell the story of how this thing became well just that a popularized you know way of drinking or style of drinking when you think about tequila you think about more often than not, people think about tradition. They think about provenance, think about heritage. Yeah. They think about all the things, right, that culminate this beautiful cultural spirit. But there's something else that it it really sort of um, is entrenched in, sort of part of its DNA, and that tequila, as it stands, if you know mezcal, you know that tequila is derived from there, right, and then became its own thing due to processes, production, where it was produced, etc., eventually culminated it into we, we now define as tequila, but tequila has always been about innovation. And that's really where I want to start. You know, when you think about tequila, again, you think about tradition, you think whatever. So people think, well, then tequila has been made and should be made in this very specific way. The, in, in its, you know, in its, in its history, right. Historically speaking, but the fact is tequila wouldn't be where it is today. It was defined as such. If it wasn't for all the innovations that came before it. Um, and this Cristalino category, this burn car is really just the latest innovation if you will and so let's start with what it is right it's on everybody's lips what is a cristalino yeah. you know we know it's a style of tequila but what exactly is it cristalino in simplest terms is an aged tequila that has been filtered to charcoal in order for us to remove some of the impurities some of those heavier oak tones right a byproduct of that is the removal of color but the intention really is to soften up that sharper oak that heavier oak you, know, you spoke of whiskeys, for example. That is how you predominantly describe a whiskey, right? It's through all the oak influence. In this instance, we want to now bring it back in balance with all those beautiful bright notes that, that are endemically known to be part of the tequila uh, taste profile, right? That citrus, that bright floral note, that terroir, if you will. So through filtration, we're able to do that. And we're able to essentially highlight all the beautiful oak tones in balance with all the bright energy that that tequila is known for. So it's essentially having the, it's essentially, and that's out with the complexity and character of an añejo or a reposado uh, with the crisp, bright notes of a blanco. You get acidity, you get brightness. Uh, you can imagine how that opens up then to different styles of use. So you talk about highballs, for example, whiskey, you mentioned that earlier. You know, it's no longer, it's more, it, it's now a spirit that opens itself up and can, you know, tequila is something that always has been able to take the place of a gin, depending on the style of tequila, right? Of a, of a whiskey, of a rum. Um, but I think this is the first time uh, the, sensorially you get that benefit as well. You know, you get sort of that. If you do a Negroni, for example, with an Añejo that's, that's, that's being put through the filtration process that is now deemed a, a Cristalino, you're going to get a very different sensorial experience than if you were to just take a Blanco straight and put it into the Negroni, if I'm making sense. You know, so that's, that's what a Cristalino is in short when you, when you define it. So while it's not an official category like a Blanco, Reposado, Añejo, Extra Añejo, um, it is a subcategory of sorts, if you will. Um, and it's something that, that was born of innovation, something that was born of exploration, and something that I think has ended us out in a new taste profile proposition that you haven't seen in tequila in a very long time, right? We had Extra Añejos added to tequila probably as official styles of tequila back in 2006, I believe. And, you know, the first original extra Nyeko became, you know, was, was put into the, onto the scene. It was brought on um, by Reserva de la Familia back in 1995, right? So you can see, you know, how back, how far back we go in terms of innovations, um, even further back than that. But that's probably one of the latest. Um, and then here in 2008 uh, was the first time that we introduced uh, Cristalino to the world. Would you would you consider that maybe that um, even as far as innovations go, it wasn't that long ago that maybe tequila was almost exclusively drank as a blanco, and then there's sort of this whiskeyfication of it that became aging in barrel, becoming repo, becoming añejo, and now as of 2006 becoming um, uh, extra añejo. Would you think that maybe then cristalino is the sort of opposite of that, sort of the vod vodkaification of tequila, like? Talk to me about like what is being stripped away through the charcoal filtering, and then uh, secondarily to that, what where's the charcoal coming from? Are you burning the barrels to make the charcoal? No, we we, we apply different styles. So let let me just take a, step, a real quick step back, and you know, you spent you mentioned uh, I'll address the first part of your yeah. comment or question mm -hmm. in, in terms of because I think it's a great one in terms of of um, 
of innovations, for example, and how we came to popularize El Reposado, or really just the introduction of oak in general, is something that, that came about probably in the, in the eight, 19th century, 1800s, right? So think of it this way. The way I, I oftentimes see sort of the innovative spirit of tequila and how it, it, it sort of came to be what it is, is you first start with mezcal, right? Conical, below ground, oven cooking, right? Agaves source from anywhere that was local to you, essentially, all these wild, these cultivated agaves, depending on the type, um, and you cooked them underground. And all of Mexico, mostly southern Mexico, was doing this. Made occidental part of Mexico and Jalisco, they were doing the same thing. The distinction between here and, let's say, the other regions of Mexico that, that preserved the traditional way of making Oaxaca really has to do with the fact that they weren't influenced outside of, you know, what they were doing, local practices, they were distilling, um, and they kept, and they kept, and they honed in on that, and they kept doing that. And it was pretty, pretty much a trial and error thing. The mid-Occidental part of Mexico, Jalisco, was a place that was very advanced in terms of um, the things that were taking place there, right? You, you had houses making mezcal that wanted to, to define it and, and, for better, for be, for you know, for the lack of a better term, uh, get to a place that was that had mass appeal, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a, you know, a spirit that other people would would want to drink. Not only this this smoky thing, you know, the smoke bomb that oftentimes, well, I don't agree. We correlate back to mezcal, so they wanted they wanted to refine it a bit. After all, remember the Spaniards are are, are present. They drank their brandies. They're starting to locally understand what other spirits can look like, and they start to essentially start to to in, start to in, in you know input or, or rather take on different processes right sure. first and foremost the biggest innovation perhaps is the 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 no longer conical oven cooking and going and removing moving over to steam baking right that was for us perhaps the biggest innovation right. now you have a softer spirit not as smoky right the next thing that comes into play is distillation you know, the coffee pot still was distilled, was, was introduced to the U.S. in the late 1800s. Mexico had it just two years after it was introduced to the U.S. So imagine now the tequila industry is also starting to impart or, you know, apply these processes that further refine spirits through continuous distillation, fractional distillation, getting better at cutting heads and tails and getting to the heart of the spirit, that kind of thing. In the late 1800s, now you start to introduce different barrel types, right, and char. And remember, we went from demijohns. Just like, you know, just like overseas in, in Europe, uh, as a way to transport this agave distillate, then move to barrels, purely mostly for, tra for, for transport, and then deliberately to start to see how that barrel started to affect the flavor of the spirit, overlaying tertiary notes, right, that... Um, that perhaps aren't endemic or aren't part of the actual process of tequila making. Now you have this overlay of flavors. So that started in hundreds. And then you had people deliberately trying to make a reposado slowly. I think what really started to happen is you had tequila that was aged. You had your blanco, fiery, white, you know, very peppery tequila. And you would take some, you know, blending started to take place. You, you would take certain distillers, again, in order to distinguish their tequila and the character they were trying to put forward. And to get it to become its own thing, you know, it, by, by, Half the sense it became its own thing. They started to take tequila and fold in all these older reserves in order to soften it. And then with time, they started to just straight age it, right? For different periods of time, getting different results, different flavor profiles, different intensity of oak uh, being imparted. So think about it. When you come, when you think about tequila in the terms of designations, you know, that didn't come until 1994 when the CRT finally and officially said, okay, how do we deem this? How do we classify this? What is this thing? So while experimentation expression was going on, historically over 200 plus years, you had people making a Blanco, making aged spirits, blending aged spirits or aged tequilas back into their Blancos, but never formally categories. They were later defined as your silvers, repos, añejos, you know, and then later came extra angles, as I mentioned previously. Um, but that's sort of the trajectory. That's sort of the, the timeline, right, with, when all of this happened. I think when we think about the addition of charcoal, I'll start with saying that depending on the expression that we're making, um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, right? We have the largest collection as the innovators and the creators of the category. Um, we have the largest, currently the largest portfolio. We call it Cristalino Colección de México, right? right? And the premise is to show you how these tequilas and some that have been made for over 200 years, we've taken their proprietary process, right, or the process that, that defines that tequila, the use of American oak or whatever type of oak it might be, 
Um, and now we've tr- introduced different finishes. And then, of course, this filtration process, which does vary from brand to brand, from expression to expression, depending on the number of plates of, of, of the charcoal we want to run it through, um, the type of carbon material. So that does, that does vary, vary a bit. And so some will get um, a little bit more filtration than others, right? And I think that's where we start to play with the alchemy of it all. And we start to see how we can transform a spirit and we can remove, yes, yeah, some of the heavier congen or some of the heavier oak notes, um, tonify them a little bit while still retaining that quintessential calling card that it might bring, right? French oak, a little bit of nuttiness, American, a little slight caramel notes, um, you know, we can talk later when we get into the tasting portion, but we have port finished tequilas. We have tequilas that have been finished in Calvados casts. So the idea is to overlay all these flavors, right? By definition, you can't have a crystallino if it's not aged. So clearly it's going to come in contact with barrel and how we tonify that, how we bring it down is what we're trying to get to. So, I mean, I leave it to you to try when we taste it, but I don't think, I think uh, the premise of vodka is really about a very pure, very for the lack of a better term, it's not the best term, a clean spirit, right? That, that, that you're trying to get to a very neutral state so that it's pleasurable. And that is the proposition there. In this instance, tequila is about flavor, right? It is about agave first and foremost centric. It is about how you overlay those tertiary flavors, as I mentioned, which then in themselves are innovations that have come over time, right? Um, that have helped to define tequila, categorically speaking. And you know the the crystallino uh, the crystallino offering is really how you take when you put these añejos extra añejos reposados next to their counterparts you'll see you'll see the slight differences in terms of how the oak lays on the palate um, but they by by no means are they neutralized or got to a point where they're filtered out and they taste like a black tail blanco if you will well I I'm gonna I'm going to put a pin in the Calvados aged tequila because that has me salivating like a dog at supper time. But we're going to, we're going to, I, I want to ask a question first because I love everything you're talking about. This sounds like an amazing uh, intersection of modern technology and the uh, old techniques that we've had for making these spirits for uh, hundreds, if, if not even potentially thousands of years. Um, I mean, at least in terms of using agave to make uh, alcoholic beverages. Um, why would people have a problem with that, though? I mean, literally, I just said this about uh, my good friends at Colonial Williamsburg, you know, like you have to innovate, like innovation is uh, the heart of staying current and staying creative and challenging yourself. And if you're just resting on your laurels, you're going to become stale. Why are people giving you some grief about this particular thing that you're doing with tequila? I think it's a great, que- I think it's a great question. And I, you know, th- that's partly what I try to get ahead of in my last comment. You know, the, the thing is, is I think there's an expectation that tequila should be made, you know, in a particular way, right? In a particular fashion. When we think about what those things are, you think of every step of the process, dem- you know, we have to come from the blue agave plant, clearly where you grow that plant, how you grow that plant, the age to which you grow the plant, maturation cycle, all those things are going to influence flavor first and foremost, right? The type of barrel you use, et cetera. Those are in itself are all innovations as we spoke of earlier. I think people, um, when they think of tequila, they think, well, tequila has only ever been made. The truth is if it's, if we're going to drink tequila now, the way we made it 200 plus years ago, where it really, it could have stopped as a spirit, right? The biggest designation could have simply been, you know, this isn't Oaxacan mezcal. This is Jalis- Jaliscan mezcal. However, you know, it's now called tequila because it's coming from the town of tequila. And we've applied, let's just say the only innovation that was applied was steam baking over direct fire um, and perhaps, you know, continuous distillation instead of, you know, bamboo distillation, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and pottery, right? Uh, clay pots, you know, those, those innovations in themselves would classify it as a, hey, this is a different thing now. It's a different offering. And if we just stop there, it'd be, it'd be, I, I'd understand that because now we're, we're getting really away from that. But the truth is, I think that, I think the expectation is that it is oven baked, you know, still, you know, it's oaked a certain way. And I think the, the idea of applying something and then deliberately um, softening that or, or, or modifying that to, to be able to offer something new to the consumer is something that I think people take sometimes an opinion to. I don't 
clearly the masses are speaking in terms of the appeal. More and more folks are um, gravitating towards it and really exploring this category of spirit. Or again, it's called a subcategory. Given you know, it's it's going to live within repos at least for now, añecos and extra añecos. But it, there could come a point in time where the CRT recognizes it as another expression, right? Because it does require one more step in the process that's very different than what your standard spirit goes through, which is filtration. Of course, every spirit goes through that. Cellulose filtration, you want to remove particles, you remove certain things, oils, fats, etc. In this instance, it's one more step in the process that actually affects the spirit, right? And the taste profile. The numbers dictate that in Mexico, currently, uh, Cristalino is the number one consumed style of tequila sold, right? That's right. And it's what's driving the category, yeah. And it's it's something that um, that we expect will will overtake here, or rather, get to the same level here, where it's going to be its forecast is to represent a key driver of the premium, premium premiumization over the next five years. Just to give you an idea, as more and more people latch on, right? Um, you know, you talked about you talk about Mexico. Mexico is where this this was born, right? And Mexico, actually, if you will, for the lack of a better term, you know, sort of sort of um, entrenched the spirit culturally in a way that gave us here in the U.S. the opportunity to observe and understand or at least acknowledge what was happening, right? We all know that in spirits, and you said it perfectly earlier, it's, you know, it's about innovation, it's about trends, it's about different styles of consumption, people's taste profiles change. I mean, I personally, you know, have experienced different ways that I like to drink certain spirits that whereas traditionally I drank them one way, I now appreciate them in different formats. So I think that when you think about all those factors, I think people are open to innovation. I think people people like the idea of a new, again, flavor proposition, which is really where we're where, where, where we've netted out here. You know, there's there's it being clear and it works perfectly for cocktail application, but it's not the end or the means to an end. It's not why um it's not why it's filtered. It's a byproduct of it, right? At the end of the day, it's about flavor. It's about how you can apply it. Um, and Mexico has had 15 plus years of experimenting with it. You know, we, this, the first, the world's first Cristalino's Maestro Lobel. It was launched, uh, back in 2008 by Juan Domingo and, uh, Beckman, you know, 11th generation Cuervo, uh, family member. So you have, hundreds of years of tequila making know-how who observed that in the early 2000s here you have this 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 cocktail scene that's starting to sort of bubble up in Mexico you have different drink trends happening you have a lot of people getting away from what traditionally was perhaps the preferred spirit of choice añejos that kind of thing gravitating to gins and other blanco spirits uh, outside of the category or other white spirits outside of the category and you know the, the idea, the aha moment was how do we how do we create something that would appeal to folks that are looking for this type of drink, but still classically says tequila, right? Right. How for all all the ways we've defined it, right? And that was back in two thousand eight with Master Dobell, and you know it, it took a minute, but people started to latch on. And um, sorry, the only the other anecdote I want to share is. Uh, just to give you an idea, you know, no, they weren't called Cristalinos then. Just to give you an idea of how this starts to take shape on its own, right? Like most things, uh, especially in the spirits world, you know, people start to refer to things in a certain way. So it was, it was a descriptor used, but for example, our first expression was called the Amante. We called it the Amante because it was crystal clear and clearly there was a shimmer to it and and, and a brightness that we wanted to, to call attention to. But um, but Cristalino is something that started to take shape. The more we started to to put them out into market, the more other purveyors started to add them into into their portfolios, um, and then we and then we're, we created this sort of subcategory. But it was initially um, exploration, experimentation. It was and it was Juan Domingo uh, Beckman essentially uh, essentially borrowing from other other spirits, which we know, you know, rum, vodka, whiskeys have been applying or using some uh, form of charcoal filtration. Uh, long before we did. Um, so it's about how do you take that innovation? How do you take that inspiration and apply it over to tequila? Right. Um, you you said that, uh, and we, we already discussed that it's the uh, kind of dominant um, sales right now in, in Mexico where tequila comes from. Um, so that speaks a lot to its popularity. Um, how are people enjoying it? You, you mentioned cocktails, but, you know, I think that when I think of Repo and Inejo, I think of sipping and you're taking a repo or in your yeah. and you're crystallizing or you know clarifying it rather I should say. Um, are people still sipping it as well? Like how do you how do you enjoy a cristalino? 
Well, I, I'll start by demystifying a couple of things. Yes, in Mexico, traditionally people, añejos, they tend to sip them. When it comes to other like reposados and some añejos, depending, Mexico historically has been a big highball country, you know? Um, if you think of the batanga, which or, is yeah, coke, say, tequila, lime, lime tequila, salt. A hundred percent. If you think of the paloma, highball, grapefruit, lime, salt, um, Mexico, as always, Mexico loves their whiskey. You mentioned that earlier, uh, or just going back to the to whiskey you mentioned earlier. You know, they, they've always applied soda or some sort of mineral soda. So tequila has always been in shots, predominantly. Añeco sips, sure, but the other age expressions, and some, again, some with, with exceptions, some añecos, as long as they're not too costly, have oftentimes gone into uh, highballs. So the 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 coming on the, the sort of the the birth of the cult of the cocktail scene made it so that Mexico started to pay attention to all of these other classic cocktails that were happening in the U.S. that were happening abroad and start applying tequila to them. But traditionally, when it came when it came to tequila, we were still lengthening the drink, if you will. That was a very common practice. So right now, what we're actually seeing is we're seeing a return to really appreciating spirits neat in general. So it's kind of a, an interesting place to be because you you see you see a culture that is taking a cristalino for example sipping it on the rocks sipping it eating a you know in a flute tequila glass uh, a rocks glass um perhaps with an expressed oil and you're also seeing the application of of these cocktails and so predominantly elevated cocktails uh think of riffs on negronis um old fashions martinis i think what we're finding is that there is that delicate balance between this bright spirit and this oakiness, these warm cooking spices that uh, define most Cristalinos that I think, uh, you know, to put them in a cocktail that classically celebrates the very base of that cocktail um, is kind of what's leading this charge is we're finding it stands up great in, in, in cocktails where the very premise is to just really, really highlight and really celebrate that that spirit so you know no longer just drowning it right in mm -hmm. in a sour or what have you but really really building a drink around it that amplifies the flavor yeah well this is this is a good way to to start talking about like some of the flavor notes on these because i got this i'm going to hold up for our, our patreon regulars to see first of all i love this wacky bottle uh damon's not here uh today yeah, unfortunately he had to uh save his voice for a gig over the holiday weekend because as we've all learned over the past week if you have a big thing coming up Save your voice. You yeah. don't want to be going into these things worse. Okay. Um, but uh, I love the, the, the slight kind of like, you know, uh, almost kind of like surrealist thing that this bottle has going on. It's like clean, but it has like, it's just a little bit off center. And I think that's neat. But the flavor on this, I loved. It was very fruity, but it was also very round. There was a real like warmth and approachability to it. And I was wondering, it's a, a Reposado Cristalino. This is the uh, the Grand Coromino. Um, speaking of how you would drink this, I mean, I had a good time drinking it neat, but would you, would you cocktailify this? How would you show yeah. kind of the different aspects of what we got here? You Okay, cool. So what, what would you, what would you do with it? I'm, I'm very curious. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 yeah, we have, as a matter of fact. And, and the thing, let me just first start with that is um, a, a passion project between uh, Grant Cormino was born of a passion project between um, Kevin Hart and, and Juan Domingo Beckman. It's the first uh, collaboration he's ever done. Uh, and th the intention was, how do we create something that marries what Kevin was looking for and clearly our tequila making know-how or his, their tequila making know-how. So uh, that's what this is. This is the embodiment of that. What you have here is you have a reposado, right? Technically speaking, you know, it's between two and 12 months, comes in contact with Eastern European oak barrels, and then we finish it in um, a cab cask. And that is to pay homage to Kevin Hart's current um, home and, and his love uh, for uh, for red wine. So um, that's what you have there. So spot on, It's it's it starts out with this, uh, this, uh, this agave lace sort of spiced oakiness. Um, it's got a very round note to it. It's got a, a slightly dry finish, um, but it works exceptionally well. This is one that does really well in a great highball with the premium, um, you know, uh, uh, sparkling and perhaps a tincture. You know, uh, we've done things like that. We've uh, we've put this into um, different um, 
old fashioned formats, for example, but instead of, you know, your classic, for example, orange bitters, we put in a little bit of, of, you know, um, chocolate or Oaxaca and things to sort of bring you back to that, to that slight oakiness. Um, so it just, it works, it works and it stands up really well. I mean, does it make a great margarita? You know, we know that consumers are going to think, well, tequila, it's soft, it's smooth, it's all these things. I, I'm going to toss it into my favorite margarita. Um, it'll be present. It'll stand up. It'll, it'll work there. But where it really shines is, is those three to four ingredient cocktails, right? Back to my original point where you can just really celebrate either contrast or complement the inherent taste notes that are in that spirit. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll tell you what I wanted to do. I wanted to throw it into a 50-50 martini. I thought that would have been a fun, fun right. mixture at that one. Yeah. No, yeah, we've tried 50-50 with some of the other expressions you have in front of you. But yeah, that's exactly exactly it. I mean, um, I think the sky's the limit, really, in terms of, of what you can do with this with this style of spirit. Right. I poured myself some of the, um, the Maestro Dobel Diamante, which is sort of the original one, right? So let's talk about how that's right. That's our original offering. Yeah. So let's talk about how that one sort of set it off, it flavor wise, and then I'll compare it to I poured the Grand Centenario. Just to, I just randomly picked from the four you sent me here, and I'll taste that one side by side. Um, so let's talk about the flavor notes of those two. But what I what I also want to ask is, do you think that some of the pushback uh, about Cristalinos is coming from an inherent difficulty to? It's just simply difficult to premiumize a product that is traditionally for the everyman. Is, is that, a, is that a, a fair way assessment of it? I think if I'm understanding correctly, um, you know, I, I think tequila has had that hurdle really, or, you know, approached that hurdle really early on and got over it. I think after it's after the two thousands when we had a mass mass um, issue with, uh, with agave production and or agave scarcity and, um, now it's a culmination of over, uh, you know, of, of, of over indexing the, 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 the category was on fire. People were drinking it and a huge plague that was happening in New Mexico. And I think at that point, if you might recall, if you guys were, were drinking it then, you know, um, uh, price points went up and the premiumization of tequila actually mm-hmm. happened, right? And Mexico felt it, the U.S. felt it, but it was a spirit. It was a category of spirit that, that the industry felt deserved that recognition, you know, having gone through that huge hurdle, um, it's how do you get, you know, how do you get your, how do you get to the point where you, where you, where you get the spirit to, to be valued and, and appreciated for what it is. After all, the agave plant takes anywhere between eight to 10 years sometimes to grow in the, in the ground, not to mention the several years for aging, you know, we've always compared tequila and whiskey to uh, whiskey. Everything happens for years after distillation, whereas tequila, everything happens for years before in distillation. But in before, this scenario, yeah. you're kind of you're kind of doing both. Yeah, you're you're taking those years in the ground, and now you're putting it for a very you know not crazy as long as whiskey, but a lengthy amount of time in barrel. So you're you're, you're crossing the timeline on both sides, and that's again premiumization, which relates, frankly, to cost of good. And this is something that was you know, when I say the everyman, you know, this was just the work a day. Uh, uh, spirit of Mexico, right? Is it? Do you do you find it's diff? I mean, it's number one seller, so it must not be. But do you think that that's maybe some of the pushback? Because this category definitely gets a lot of pushback. I, frankly, I am one of the ones who's pushed back against it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you find that that that's maybe part of it? I don't think it applies. I think it would have applied, and I think that was probably my point. It, it was it was apply. It, I think it was it was something that was uh, that was definitely pre- prevalent. I don't think it's as relevant these days. I think with the introduction of añejos, extra añejos, I think more and more people have understood um, that there is cost yeah. to craft to your point, that there is more steps in the process and that that's going to come, uh, at right. a cost. And I think that, um, uh, I think you have more and more people, you know, buying your $200 plus bottles of tequila out there that are, that are, that I think the masses understand that there's something for everybody within the category and that's as wide as it spans. And yeah. that for the everyday person, if you want something a little bit more within grasp, a little more economical, you can get that without having to break the bank and get for and get something that maybe a whiskey appreciator or somebody that loves their age spirits, right? Transitionally sort of drinks tequila because that's the preferred, you know, somebody that's been working in this field for 20, almost 25 years, you know, you come across everything. You think that there's somebody that truly loves tequila and you find out actually they're a massive whiskey drinker. The only exception they ever make when they drink tequila tends to be with the aged expressions and or you have somebody that loves tequila, but they never taste the aged expressions because, well, they 
they inherit they just they just want the agave they want that green that herbaceous no you know the 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 specialness of what defines tequila the heart and soul of it really really comes to be very pronounced um and then you have the middle person that wants to do it only in margaritas i'm sure we will come across those folks right or or the person that says you know to greg oh i at a seminar oh i love i love you know whiskey um and then you ask well how do you drink it and you come to find that the only way they drink it is an x right cocktail or what have you and that's the only time they'll ever drink whiskey um you know you have that in, in tequila right, as in well a sour, yeah. that's hiding the qualities of the whiskey. yeah you have yeah. margarita drinkers yeah. that go i love tequila i'm like great which do you like they're like i don't know but i like a strawberry margarita and i'm like that's phenomenal that's phenomenal that is what yeah. catalyst is driving yeah. you to drink tequila but but they don't they don't they don't seem to go past that threshold you know right so if if someone comes up to you and says, you know, I I I just think Cristalino's gimmicky. Like I think it's just a cash grab. I think it's just a gimmick. And you have thirty seconds to change their mind. What what do you say back to them? Well, assuming that I'm there, the likelihood of me having a bottle on me is probably very very high. So I I would encourage. Them. <laughs> so you wouldn't even you would only need like the five. I would need yeah. I'm like let me taste you on it, and I think a side by side is warranted here. And you're you're about to do that now, for example, with Dovel and Gran Tenario. These two couldn't be more different. Um, and and the yeah. truth is, you know, whenever you I hear the Dovel, yes. So okay, so let me tell you about Dovel. So Dovel is a um, it's what we call a multi age, meaning it contains the quilas that are technically classified as reposados. Añejos and extra añejos, all finished in the same type, brand new Eastern European oak barrels. However, different char levels, clearly different time, live different uh, amounts of time. It's taking these tequilas that have laid in, have been laid in these barrels for these disproportionate amount of times, and or taking them and disproportionately blending them together is how is it is essentially the 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 recipe, if you will, right? And then it goes into the filtration process. So what you have here is you have, I think sensorially when you drink it, the introduction at first is very, you know, you don't quite get that sort of peppery flash you get from tequila, but you do get a nice sort of brightness that then leads into, uh, of cooked agave that then leads into this very mid palate of warm, rounded spice notes, a little bit of honey notes. You'll get a little bit of chamomile going on. You'll get a little bit of, um, of, uh, of uh, sort of to- very light toffee, and then it, it leads it leads into this very dry sort of uh, finish, and I think that's the extra yeah, I get talking a little bit of, to you. I get a little, yeah, I get a little bit of almost cedar, you know, uh, off of it too, uh, like a little you know um, fresh woodiness, not like a barrel woodiness. Um, the, you just blew my mind though while you were talking there. It, it, it occurred to me. So now you've added yet another step. So he the they're blending aged tequilas. So, so now we're blending. So we had to grow it in the, in the field for years. Then we had to distill it and age it in barrel for some amount of time. Now we got to go through the process of blending, which is an art and a, a science all of its own. One hundred percent. And then the filtration. System. Correct. So I have to ask because <laughs> because that's what we do here on this show. Um, it, are we selling the blend? Can you is there a step in there where they're bottling some of that blend? Because that's got to be delicious too, or they wouldn't go to the next step of doing the next. Oh thing, well, right? yeah, you, you well, yeah. So something delicious. No, that's a great question. So whereas we we in this instance we can't draw parallels or or you know um, necessarily you know con- like we right now I can't tell you we have a double that straight age that has those three barrel finishes in order to taste side by side, but I can tell you that the line. Uh, is known for blending in part, right? And so the truth is a lot of these expressions mm-hmm. you have in front of yeah. you are in fact different oak finish blends and or, sorry, a different blending of, of different oak barrels and or uh, the addition of a um, of another cask, right, for finishing. So there is there there is that and and you know i think if you have a you know let let's talk about gran centenario and that'll be that you know that'll be um one example of of another tequila that uses different age right uh age statements in the blend and then is finished uh but if you if we move on to 1800 for example and yako cristalino you'll find that that is a marriage of two different types of oaks which we could we can talk about and then finishing Right. And you can, in fact, you know, and I can tell you a little bit about, wh- you know, why that, how that was, how that came about. And that has to do with, you know, it's everything to do with the, the, the calling card of, of 1800, which is a French and American white oak sort of 
um, blend, right? So in, in terms of the asset scenario that you have in front of you, so the asset scenario is calling card. It's, you know, unlike Dobell, which is Eastern European and other oak barrels, exotic oaks, this one here is predominantly, it's American, brand new American oak, right? So what you have here is you have an Añejo, technically classified as an Añejo. I don't know if I said this before, but the way that blends work in Mexico is unlike age statements and whiskey or what have you, um, or like age statements where you call the, you know, you call out the youngest in the blend. In tequila, we call out the youngest expression in that blend. So if you have an Añejo, if you have a Reposado, extra Añejo, it's going to be a Reposado. If you have a, a an Añejo with extra Añejo and it blended in, it's going to still be, it's going to be then classified as an Añejo. In this instance, it's an Añejo right. with extra Añejo reserves blended in, American oak, aged, and then brand new barrels, deeper chars, and then we go um, into the Calvados cask, which I, you t I think you took interest in earlier. I thought this was a a one. great proposition. I think it's something that um, is very rarely seen in uh, in the uh, tequila category, and I think really added another element of distinction and flavor, clearly to the overall um, flavor composition for 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 Gran Centenario. And particularly when you look at the portfolio across the board, traditionally speaking, Gran Centenario has always been American white oak, very oaky. Um, we do this, you know, this something called Selección Sabo, where they blend different older reserves with younger to sort of balance out and, and, and create this flavor complexity. Um, and, and here, what you have is you have the now an overlay on top of that of this of this Calvados cask. It we're, spends about four four to five months in in contact with that with that barrel. Yeah, on the nose I get on the nose from this one I get a little bit more cooked agave, and then uh, on the back palate of it I get this sort of like cooked fruit quality. I think that's coming from the stewed apple. Really delicious. Yeah, I get everything from stewed to uh, sometimes a little bit of a fresh eucalyptus, fresh green apple note over to. Um, a lot of stone fruit for me, at least on the back end. I can't quantify. Sometimes I quantify it as like you know ripened stone fruit. Sometimes it's cooked stone fruit. To to your point, um, but yeah, I'd agree with that. It's 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 got also a, a an acidity and a, and a brightness that I like. I I, I don't want to geek out too much, but oftentimes um, I remind <laughs> you're like too late, right? I remind folks that <laughs> we're, we're an hour into you geeking out, buddy. I remind folks that um, that part of the drinking experience, sensorially speaking, because it is a sensorial experience, right? It's not just about the mouth, the palate, the taste profile, but you know, we we forget how a spirit um, lands on the palate. And for me, acidity is a big one. You know, the lower pH, the higher acidity. Some spirits have more of it than others. Um, I think that's something that I look for personally, whether it stands up and it cuts through a cocktail, you know, how it, how it acts and, you know, and tastes in, in, in a neat pour, uh, is something that I think oftentimes we forget because we only focus on flavor. Uh, but it's something I'd like to bring our minds back to. And that's that, you know, this one in particular, if you go back, for example, and taste Dobell now, you'll see how Dobell's got more of that warming spice going on. It's got that roundiness to it, very full in the mouth. And then when you get to, Centenario, you'll see that it's got a little brightness to it. It's got that very, you know, cooked agave to your point, very, um, very prominent oakiness to it. But, um, but there's still a, it, it lets you know it's an aged spirit, but there's still this, this acidity and this brightness to it that really lightens it up a bit for me. So clearly you're, you're very, I mean, clearly, clearly you believe in this uh, category and you're very good at, at, um, you know, explaining why it's not just a gimmick. You might, you might've gone a little over the 30 second clock that I gave you. I wasn't watching the time super closely, but maybe it's like, <laughs> oh, sorry, just, a little, bit, just a little bit over. Sorry, sorry. The 30 second, by the way, I just want to clarify <laughs> the 30 second. I thought I had, I had already crushed. I didn't, I didn't mean to imply that that's what, that's what I would say. I, I, I the 30 second response from me to you was I would have pulled out a bottle and had them taste it. That was it. That was, that was my hopefully five to second, you know, cause I, cause I think that's, I think proof positive. I think that's where it is, you know, quite yeah. frankly, I don't think it, it requires a big conversation when you can get someone to understand, well, get your favorite Añejo. Let me, let me taste you on a Cursolino Añejo. Now you tell me if, you know, what, whether you prefer one over the other, right? Admittedly, yeah. the, the point here, at least for me, the objective would be to establish that there is flavor one and distinguishing characteristic that make it its own thing. Yeah, totally. of these two, and, I would and, say. You know, uh, sorry, Greg. Of these two, I would say I would I would gravitate towards the first one I tasted, which was the first one, uh, the the Dobel. 
Um, but I also tend to gravitate towards Blanco tequilas that are a little bit brighter, a little bit sharper, a little bit more herbaceous, peppery notes and herb notes. And I think that one has more of that with a yeah. with a softer, lush mouthfeel. I, I, I get what the barrel did and what the what the um, what the uh, uh, um, filtration also did. Um, but I would lean towards that one first. I haven't tasted all of these yet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's it's certainly delicious. I understand we've said it numerous times in this episode already that it's currently the number one selling category of tequila unofficial category of tequila in Mexico. Why do you think it's not doing so well in America? And what do you think you got to do? It's your job, I guess, as the advocate to get the American consumer on board. What, 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 what's, why are we being so slow? I think the U S well, you've, you've led the, you've led the horse to the water. Now make us drink. Yeah, I think exactly. (laughs) Right. I think that's, that's it. Right. People know tequila. I think, I think this is something that people are discovering on their own. You know, think about it this way. At least this is how I see it. And, you know, and I am in the fold. So if you, you, you know, I love your opinion on whether you see it differently, but when have you heard anybody talk about a Cristalino, like open format, whether it be a commercial, whether it be, I don't think it's something that, Listen, as somebody who educates and someone who talks to people about tequila incessantly day in and day out, I lead a team of ambassadors as well. That's why I'm the head of advocacy. That's what the, the role is, right? And to your point, I love that using the word advocate because that's exactly what we do, right? We It's word of mouth storytelling, advertising. It's how we get bartenders and other folks to understand um, the category, first and foremost, which I think is imperative, and then talk about what each expression or brand lends to that category. And as some, somebody that, that heads a brand that, you know, um, out in, in trade engagement and with consumers alike, that is about innovation, that is about provenance and heritage and history and 250 plus years of tequila making, uh, it's on our shoulders to explain what it is that we have and that we're offering and that we're, and how we're driving the category in many ways. Uh, and in this instance, you know, when it comes to tequila, we, why we're having these conversations, why we've created this, 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 Collection, this Cristalino Collection in Mexico is to is to give it its own moment and to be able to talk about it and point to it and say this is what this is. Let's first define it. Let's show you what steps and processes, how steps and processes affect flavor, uh, and then you said it perfectly. Decide on what you prefer based on what you typically gravitate towards or what you like. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think it's people awakening. I think it's people coming to, you know, understanding, exploring the category, uh, trying something new. I clearly we're, we're doing well in that more and more people are, are latching on and drinking this and, and discovering Cristalinos. Um, and I think it took us just a little bit more time because we, we needed to demystify. It. And I think that's kind of something that we self-identified as something that, that was necessary for us to lead, given that we started it all. Um, is what is it? How do you drink it? Um, how do we get people to try it? And that's what we're we're doing day in and day out is sampling events, et cetera. Because I don't think, listen, if I'm honest, somebody who educates and trains and does all these things uh, as part of my job, you know, as part of my job, and 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 uh, which I love, you know, it's it's something that clearly is is you know something I'm really passionate about. Um, I, I have to recognize that certain people still don't know what an añejo is. Some people don't understand the differences yeah. between expressions. Um, some people don't know what a less than 100% agave tequila is versus, a, a, you know, and why it's, every tequila is bottled on site that's 100% because they don't necessarily know the norma or the laws uh, that dictate this, right? They know that tequila can only be made in Mexico and it kind of drops off from there. So, again, right. I think we have the charge ahead of us and I think it's imperative that we, we lead that charge uh, for people to better understand what this is. But I think that's been our only challenge is that People don't know what it is. People have yet to come across it. And or to your point, perhaps somebody looked at it and said, oh, well, that's clearly a gimmick. It's clear. Again, you know, that being the byproduct of, and in, you know, it's not necessarily the intention it's in itself. And I think, uh, I think we just have to share more of that story. On a, on a personal level, uh, you know, I, I've, I've really, it's, it's a cool brand and I really appreciate all of the, uh, the bottles that you sent me and uh, I'm going to have to, when I get back to New York, break into Souther's apartment and try the fourth bottle as well. Um, <laughs> but I, I just want to, I want to ask not a question about the brand, but a question about you, Jaime. Yeah. And I, I'm just wondering because you seem 
kind of very fired up almost by offering all of these, you know, these um, stories and anecdotes and talking about the technique. And clearly this is a brand that you care about. And so I want to know on a personal level, does being on the defensive as much as you have to, when you rep Cristalinos, does it bug you? Or is that something that kind of like, do you relish the the fight a little bit? Are you kind of like, who wants, put them up. Who wants to throw hands over this? Like, yeah, what, like no, what is that I, like for I, you doing your job? <laughs> well, first of all, I hope I'm not coming across defensive. That's not my passionate yes. <laughs> defensive, no. No, 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 uh, no, no. You don't, you're not coming I, across defensive, but I'm saying that people will probably, I, no, like, it's a, you know, it's with, a great question. with a brand no, like great. this, you, you have yeah. to be on your back foot. I understood I it. Yeah, no, you're 100%. It's actually, it's actually a very great question. You can imagine, right? You do this for a living. I get interviewed quite a bit, and I think this is probably the first time I've been asked that question, especially in that way, and I think it's a phenomenal one because you know, I'm sitting here contemplating my answer. Uh, I don't, th- for me, I think it's an opportunity to have a, what I hope to be an informed discussion, right? It's even okay to call it an argument if people are respectful and mindful and, 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 um, and want to share, right? Their, their personal take on something. There is no right or wrong for me, right? This is really about personal likes. It's just really about um, how somebody, you know, decides they take in information and, and how that in turn uh, impacts their decision making process. It's not necessarily for me to question or to challenge, but more often than not, it's for me to say, well, listen, here's what this is. It may not be for you, but first and foremost, I'd love the opportunity to demystify what you think this is versus what our intention was. I think that that's a good place for me to to start. And oftentimes, yeah, I think that when you work, listen, I work in a massive portfolio, right? With a lot of brands with a lot of history, a lot of heritage, you know, that same drinker will sometimes go, well, I don't like the Christina, but I like your traditional product, right? Now the word traditional is being turned around, you know, uh, said, and, and that's where we get into the discussions around innovation, et cetera. And I think as long as you're dealing with somebody that's open equally, I'm happy to have discussions all day, but you know, at, at worst, it gets it gets tiring to have to you know defend the same point. But at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, um, it's it's again, it's it's a it's a it's an opportunity to discuss. It's an opportunity to engage. It's an opportunity to talk. It's an opportunity to open up people's minds to different things. Again, I listen. I myself am a consumer. I get thrown things my way constantly. Um, I have my own guardrails and my own you know, sort of, you know, deliberation process in terms of what I think might, you know, be suited for me. Um, but I'm open. I'm open and I'm receptive to what someone else's viewpoint might be. And more often than not, I try to approach it from that, from that angle. You know, it's let's have a discussion. Well, listen, um, we're getting to the end of time here. Uh, well, our time. Time, time hopefully is going to keep going. Um <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of discussing with people, how can people follow along with what you're doing, you know, social media, et cetera, and get into these discussions with you or start these cons- discussions in their own uh, communities so they can talk about getting this product either on their shelves or on their back bars or in their homes? Absolutely. So, um, first of all, I think we could probably share the, you know, the, all of our handles for the different expressions that we have and the brands. But um, if you want to follow me personally, I'm at the letter J, the tequila guy. That is my Instagram social. It's also my Twitter, um, Jay the Tequila Guy. And there you get to see a little bit of how we bring these brands to life, right? That's a part of it as well is yeah. getting people to understand not only what we are, but what we're about. And um, and so, you know, we're doing these, you know, I'm doing sessions at Tales of the Cocktail, which I'm sure you're familiar with, coming Great. up here in a couple of weeks. Good to see you there. Yeah. And that's the gist is exactly that is. Hey guys, let's get in. Let's get in a forum and talk about what this is. You know that if you you've been to Tales, you know that there's going to be a lot of opinion. But again, I think um, when done respectfully and uh, and when you have these these spirited exchanges of thoughts and information, I think um, I think it's all fair in love and war. <laughs> Well, right on. We'll get uh, uh, we'll get the, all the handles for everybody in the show notes. But yours is Jay the Tequila Guy. That way, people can yeah. contact you and probably see all those other brands uh, as well, just in in that spot. Uh, and we'll definitely look forward to seeing you down at Tales of the Cocktail. Really informative. Uh, certainly opened my eyes to a lot of things that I didn't know about Cristalino. I, I definitely um, I definitely have been on that sort of hesit- hesitant side to jump on board with the category. 
uh, well, the unofficial category. I didn't realize it was unofficial. It hasn't even been official officialized. That's right. Um, but uh, not yet, man, not really, yet. really, I feel like I learned a lot. I took a lot of notes during this show. So I, um, that's that's uh, that's that's a sign of a good show to me when, when I learned a lot. I so. really appreciate. I really appreciate you having me. And um, yeah, I really appreciate the exchange and uh, being able to um, shed some light. Yeah, thank you. And thanks so much. Well, we we loved having you yeah, on. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, that's gonna, I think, do it for us this week here on the Speakeasy. But uh, be sure to tune in next week. We're gonna have Turner Lewis, who is the founder of Four Cocktails. Uh, that's F O R E. It is a line of RTDs based around the sport of golf. So uh, a little bit, a little bit more convincing, I think. Sport or a game? <laughs> I think it's a game. Uh, yeah, yeah, sport, game, pastime. Uh, you know what? What is it? Uh, a very complicated long walk, whatever it is. But uh, there might be there might be some more convincing to be done for the hosts uh, next week as well. So be sure to tune in for that. And if you want some more Speakeasy, uh, be sure to become a regular on our Patreon. We are going to get video episodes, bonus episodes, guest recipes, and as of next month, yeah. uh, the subscribers to the bias a bottle level of the Patreon will get a free kit from Shaker and Spoon every month uh, from our good friends at Shaker and Spoon, including yeah. including a few designed uh, by some hosts of the Speakeasy Southern. That's right. Uh, yeah, well, Shaker and Spoon has been a good friend to us, uh, and now they're going to... Um... Uh, give us a little something for our top tier uh, uh, Patreons, uh, a, a cocktail kit that'll be sent to their house every month. Uh, uh, all you have to do is add booze, but everything else you need for to make the cocktail be right there at your fingertips from Shaker and Spoon. Absolutely. And we'll pop a link for that into the show notes. But for now, that is going to do it for us this week. Have a great weekend, everybody. And until next time, cheers. Yeah. And stay safe for the 4th of July. I don't want to hear about anybody losing any fingers. So this isn't going to air till after the 4th of July. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, guys. So you don't shun the devil with your The Speakeasy is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food and drink radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe. It's gonna get